Hello, and welcome to Riverside's Heart Month Lecture Series. In honor of Heart Month, Riverside is excited to be presenting a new community lecture on a different topic each Thursday during Heart Month. While most of these talks have focused on the heart or cardio portion of cardiovascular health, today we are going to focus on the vascular component. While the heart pumps the blood, it takes the vascular system to take the oxygen-rich blood to all parts of the body and bring it back to the heart and lungs to be re-oxygenated. While the terms we use to talk about vascular disease may not be as familiar as the terms such as heart attack or heart failure, the problems can be just as serious. Today, we have two vascular surgeons joining us, Dr. Satyith Mohan and Dr. Dejurabek Babajanov of Riverside Vascular Specialists, to help us learn more about the vascular system, as well as what problems in different areas of the circulatory system in our bodies can look like, and what we can do to try to keep our vascular systems healthy. There will be a lot of information covered, but you can rewind and listen to any part again if you want to. Or for additional information, please visit Riverside's Heart and Vascular website at riversideonline.com heart. And now we will get straight to the presentation, starting with Dr. Mohan. Dr. Mohan? Good morning. My name is Dr. Mohan. I'm a vascular surgeon here at Riverside. We're going to take a quick look at the vascular surgery side of things here and uh, give you a quick introduction to what we do. So the vascular system is essentially the plumbing of the human body. Uh, oxygen filled blood from the heart that's delivered from the lungs is then transported to the rest of the body, which then provides oxygen and essential nutrients to all the tissues and uh, various components of the body. The body then releases carbon dioxide and other materials to be transported back to the heart via veins. So arteries derive their pressure from the heart itself, which acts as a pump. The veins are returned to the heart via a number of one-way valves and compression from muscles and us breathing, which then pulls the blood back to the heart. Now, if there's problems with the plumbing, we can either have problems with not enough oxygen-filled blood getting to the end organs or too much back pressure leading to swelling and other concerns, either problems with the arteries or problems with the veins. So this can manifest in various parts of the body. If you don't have adequate oxygen to the brain, you can have stroke or mini stroke. Inadequate oxygen to the heart can lead to coronary artery disease and heart attack. If you have abnormal strength of the blood vessel itself, where the blood vessel gets thinned out and can expand, that can balloon out, which is called an aneurysm. And aneurysms can happen all over the body, either in the aorta, in the brain, um, in the chest or abdomen. If you have narrowing to the blood vessels to the kidneys, you can lead it can lead to high blood pressure and kidney disease. And of course, more, most commonly, narrowing of the arteries to the lower extremities can lead to something called claudication or even ulcers of the legs. We'll go through a few of these more specifically. There are several risk factors that lead to vascular disease. Smoking is really the biggest risk factor that we see. Smoking causes damage to the lining of the blood vessels on the inside, which then leads to cholesterol and plaque buildup, which then hardens and narrows the arteries. This reduces the amount of blood flow getting beyond that narrowing. Diabetes is another major risk factor, which has a similar type of process, but affects the very small blood vessels in the body. Uh, family history of vascular issues can be hereditary and we can get similar type of problems that uh, your parents or relatives may have had. And lastly, high blood pressure can also lead to damage of the lining of the blood vessels and cause hardening and narrowing. Of course, as we age, we all develop some amount of narrowing, which is very much expected. So let's take a quick look at the arteries and veins of the lower extremities or the legs. So as you can see in this picture, the arteries come down and branch out like a tree and the vessels get smaller and smaller as they go to the small arteries 
and eventually deliver oxygen to the muscles and uh, soft tissues. Now, this tree is also going in the opposite direction through the veins where the blood is then collected and returned to the heart. Let's look at the venous side of things in the legs. In the legs, we have both deep veins and superficial veins. The deep veins do the majority of the work in turning blood to the heart. And that's depicted in the picture on the left. I'm sorry, the picture on the right. And the superficial veins then carry the excess fluid in the, sub, in the subcutaneous tissue and then return it via the deep veins where it joins either behind the knee or up in the groin area. And these veins have one-way valves inside them. So as we walk, our muscles push upon the veins and push it up. And these one-way valves prevent the blood from coming back down. Um, and gravity is always pulling the blood back down. So these one-way valves are very important. Now, we can get several problems with veins. I'm sure you may have heard of something called deep vein thrombosis or DVT. This is essentially a blood clot that occurs in the veins of the leg, especially the deep veins. Um, this can lead to several problems. It can lead to significant swelling and pain of that leg. Sometimes this clot can even break off and travel to the lungs and cause what's called a pulmonary embolism. That could potentially even be life-threatening. So it's very important to identify a DVT if it occurs and get the appropriate treatment. Another condition we treat is something called chronic venous insufficiency. And this is because those one-way valves that we discussed aren't working properly. So this leads to blood being pumped up as we walk, but it comes right back down because gravity is pulling it down and these valves are not doing their job in preventing that blood from coming back down. So this causes chronic swelling and skin changes of the lower legs, which can then lead to even ulcers and uh, significant problems. Another component of chronic venous insufficiency is varicose veins. Because of this chronic swelling and venous hypertension, blood can pool in the legs and can lead to varicose veins to develop. And this can be either completely asymptomatic or can be very tender and symptomatic with uh, pain, um, itching, or burning. Another condition we treat is something called a non-thrombotic iliac vein lesion. Essentially, there's an obstruction downstream to where the blood is going. Um, and so blood can't flow back to the heart properly. And this compression is typically in the pelvis where the veins come together um, and join the inferior vena cava. At that segment, the aorta, which is the arterial side, comes over this segment and compresses the vein. And this can lead to significant like swelling, uh, chronic venous insufficiency, and even significant DVT. We can go in and fix this lesion and remove any clot at the same time. So in this image on the right, you can see that there's a very tight narrowing in the first box where the arrow is pointing. And then after it's stented in, in box B, you can see they've injected some contrast and it's much uh, more open without any narrowing in box C. Now, pelvic venous insufficiency is another condition we treat. This is a condition where typically females develop very significant pelvic pain, um, even flank pain, pain with intercourse, or even blood in the urine. And this is because the veins of the pelvis are not able to drain properly back to the heart. There's typically a compression of the renal vein, which is the kidney vein, um, that's connected to some of the ovarian veins. There's also potentially narrowing of the iliac vein, like we discussed in the last slide. And so we can treat these veins or relieve obstruction to help with these symptoms. And this can often be a very challenging uh, disease to kind of treat because Patients have often gone to many other providers to try to figure out what's going on. And ultimately this um, becomes the diagnosis. 
So how can we prevent vein health problems? If you spend a lot of time on your feet or you're sitting for large parts of the day because of your work, um, compression stockings are essential. What we're trying to do is prevent that blood from pooling in the legs to prevent varicose veins and chronic venous insufficiency. So compression stockings should really be worn anytime you're upright. So that essentially means you put it on first thing in the morning when you get dressed and keep it on all day until you go to bed at night. Again, like I mentioned, you want to avoid sitting or standing for long periods of time. So if you're traveling um, or you're working, try to get up and move around and walk every hour or two to allow that blood to be pumped back to the heart. And finally, taking care of the skin is essential, especially if you already have some venous disease. So that means adequate um, moisturization, treating any wounds that may be there and preventing any new wounds from developing. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us in this video. My name is Jurebek Babajanov. I'm one of the vascular surgeons in, uh, at Riverside uh, Regional Medical Center. I'll take it uh, from here, from Dr. Mohan, and we'll talk about peripheral arterial disease, carotid artery stenosis, and aortic aneurysms. So the first is peripheral arterial disease. Peripheral arterial disease happens when you have a blo uh, blo blockages in the arteries going down to your legs. It it's happens from atherosclerosis or cholesterol buildup in your circulation. Uh, and it can be divided uh, into different stages as you can see on the screen. So the first uh, three stages are called claudication. Claudication is, in the, is the pain in your legs when you walk certain distances can be one block, two block, three block, and then it, it, it slowly progresses to the rest pain, and then it progresses to the non-healing wounds, and then finally gangrene, which may lead to the um, amputations and limb loss. First uh, three stages, usually we don't do nothing else but medical management. We usually make people quit smoking and start walking as much as they can, and there's all kinds of exercise regimens. Starting with the stage four, when people start having pain at night, we usually recommend an intervention, which is either endovascular or open or hybrid. And um, for peripheral vascular disease, the most important thing to prevent it is, is like I mentioned before, stop smoking and then participate in, in exercise regimens. Um, and uh, be on antiplatelet agents, which is the aspirin and uh, cholesterol lowering drugs, such as um, statin medications. All kind, uh, there are different conditions which can um, be confounding, um, such as uh, back issues, bulging discs and herniated discs and narrowing of a spinal canal causing something, the condition called sciatica. Um, there's also some joint issues in the hips and the knees. And then there's a neuropathy, which is a pain, burning pain in the, in the lower extremities. As a, usually it's a consequence of a diabetes. Um, Next, we'll talk about carotid artery disease. Carotid artery disease is similar to peripheral vascular disease, but this time the you know, blockages happen in the arteries going to the brain. Um, there's two large arteries in the front called carotid arteries and two smaller ones in the back called vertebral arteries. And either one of them getting blocked acutely or slowly over time can cause different degrees of strokes. So we usually make a diagnosis at the primary physician's office through the physical exam and listening to your carotid arteries. When they hear something called bruit, um, they may refer you to have a carotid ultrasound done and that shows the narrowing. We usually do uh, the interventions. Um, actually, before we do interventions, we usually recommend uh, smoking cessation, blood pressure control, glucose control, cholesterol control, and antiplatelet agents such as aspirin and Plavix. Um, and um, there's a different degrees of narrowing that 
not all degrees of narrowing require an intervention, but when we do require an intervention, it can be either open, uh, which is a traditional old school way of uh, repairing, and it's done through the uh, about a four inch incision on the side of the neck and artery is cleaned up from a plaque and closed with a patch. The other way is to stent it. Stenting can be done through the groin or through the neck. Um, we prefer to do it through the neck. Um, and then uh, patients will be surveyed for the rest of their lives after these surgeries. So the signs and symptoms of stroke are usually, stroke is usually abrupt. Um, it's, it, it's usually uh, people stop moving one side of a body or, or, or um, lose uh, balance and fall. Um, sometimes people have difficulties in speech and swallowing. Sometimes people have some vision changes such as uh, dots in front of their eyes or shades upside down or sideways. Um, those can be signs of stroke and, and they're very abrupt. In this kind of situations, it's better to call 911 and uh, because if, if it's really a stroke, then it, something needs to be done for that. So in general, how to improve your vascular health? Um, number one thing is to stop smoking. Smoking cigarettes, nicotine is, narrows down the circulation uh, throughout the body and, and creates um, cracks in the blood vessels where the cholesterol starts kind of uh, building up. And then that's how you have a blockage. And the more you smoke, the more of that process will happen uh, in the legs, in the heart, in, in, in the arteries going to your uh, brain. Um, then there's um, exercise regimens, which is simplifying it is pretty much walking at least 20 minutes a day, then uh, managing your high cholesterol um, and uh, managing your blood sugar with HbA1c under seven in general, also controlling your blood pressure over 140, uh, under 140 over 90. And then uh, if you have any leg swelling, uh, we recommend uh, walking again, as long as tolerated then wrapping your legs and then elevating them at night. So next we will uh, talk about aortic aneurysms. Aortic aneurysm is the um, bulging or weakness of the aortic wall, as it's shown in the picture here, it happens because the aortic wall gets weaker over the age, uh, with the age, or with a certain connective tissue disorder such as Marfan syndrome, um, and then because it's weaker, uh, it gets bigger and bigger in diameter, and at some point it may needs to be something needs to be done. Um, it happens in about 1% to 3% of general population and then more common in men than women. Uh, about 80% of them happen below the renal arteries right here on the picture. Uh, and about 10% of them happen, 20% uh, of them happen above in the chest or in the upper abdomen. So we, um, the diagnosis wise, um, sometimes uh, astute, uh, primary care physicians, they find a pulsatile mass uh, in the belly, and then, then they order ultrasound or CT scan. But most often, it's, it's found as an accidental finding uh, when doing a CT scan for the abdominal pain or anything else. Sometimes people find it on the Medicare eligibility test when they turn 65, and Anybody who smokes over 100 cigarettes, 100 packs in their lifetime is eligible for this test uh, at the age of 65. Um, and uh, eventually, when um, aortic aneurysms grow, they may rupture. And rupture is life threatening condition and is an emergency. Um, usually, 50% uh, people after the rock who had a ruptured aortic aneurysms, they don't make it to the hospital. And 50% of people who make it to the hospital don't leave the hospital. Um, so it is, it is really life-threatening condition. So um, we, when it comes to an intervention, we only intervene when risk of surgery um, um, when actually benefit of surgery outweighs the risk of surgery, um, 
and there's a certain sizes where we intervene. Uh, so, so diameter uh, more than 5.5 millimeter uh, centimeters actually, uh, which is a little bit over two inches um, or growth more than five millimeter um, in six months um, is an indication for repair or any patient who has unexplained abdominal pain uh, who also has a large aneurysm and there's no other explanations for this abdominal pain. Uh, it's called symptomatic aneurysm. It needs to be repaired. So repair can be done um, two ways. The traditionally in the past, it was done with the open incision uh, in replacing the aneurysmal part with the prosthetic graft. Uh, now about 90% of aneurysms where we can uh, put a stent and it's a covered stent what it does, it just covers the aneurysm and it excludes the flow inside of the aneurysm. And it can be done through sticks in both legs and then patients stay one day and go home the next day. And as long as um, we follow all the anatomic criteria uh, for this procedure, um, it's a very durable procedure. This concludes um, our um, um, talk about vascular diseases. Um, if you have any questions uh, or, or concerns, um, you, can, you can call our office at 757-534-5340 and we'd be happy to help you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Babajanov and Dr. Mohan for sharing all of this information with us today. We've learned a lot about the vascular system and what arterial and venous problems can look like, ways to treat these different conditions, and most importantly, how we can try to stay healthy and avoid these problems in the vascular system to begin with. I hope everyone enjoyed the discussion as much as I have, and I hope people have had a chance to listen to the other Heart Month lectures. If you haven't seen them, please visit riversideonline.com slash heart month where you can find links to them or see them on our various social media outlets such as Facebook or visit Riverside's YouTube channel. Please keep an eye out for other future health lectures that we can share on those same channels. Thank you again for joining us and I hope you have a good day. Bye-bye.